Hey. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. That's a really nice room. I literally just got this painted last uh, couple months ago, but the first time I've been home in a, a minute. So I, I thought you were on. I thought you were on tour. No, I'm home for three days. I go down to Florida Wednesday to do all my fingerprinting and uh, ID stuff for the year for a security company, and then back out after that. And then I kind of slow down mid October. So, gotcha. But yeah, so change up location a little bit, and then uh, yeah, but uh, you get what happened to your arm there, big dog. <laughs> I uh, ruptured my bicep tendon. Had to have surgery Friday. I had surgery on Friday. Today's Monday. I just got the. Uh, they had a big wrap on it, and I just got it off. So it's really painful. It sucks. Uh, trying to. It's uh, it's humbling. That's for sure. Now, did you? I mean, how you did it was probably the most manly thing ever. Ask not asking for help, thinking you could carry it. Like just. No, by the way, no, no it, it was a a a four foot by six foot uh butcher block countertop that there were two of them and this was this is the thing that's the most screwed up thing about so i was in the home depot parking lot putting this butcher block into the back of the pickup truck and uh you know how you kind of like pick up plywood like with your arm out like this that's how it was and i had the, i was trying to put it up in like this and that i heard three pops and it just snapped oh uh yeah it was brutal uh but the thing is, is I was putting the second one in. I'd already gotten the first one in there and they put the second one in. And then come to find out later, we didn't even need the second one. We ended up <laughs> taking it back. So what? Uh, what's the recovery time for that? Uh, six months for a full recovery. So eight weeks before I can lift anything heavier than a coffee cup. Uh, and, and we got a show in six weeks. So yeah. we're going to see... <laughs> Uh, I, I can't, I mean, I can move my fingers and stuff. I wish I could show you. I can't really pick my, pick my hand up to show you, but right. I can move my fingers. It was less painful before the surgery. I mean, I mean, the, the injury hurt, but like the soreness wasn't as bad. I got a screw in my arm now. They had to put a screw in there and like reattach the tendon. Cause basically my bicep, when I did it, it snapped all the way up into here. I had this tennis ball of my bicep was like up here. So they had to pull the tendon back down and reattach it to my forearm. That's basically what it is. If, so, if I, so I can't, so I can't, so I can't lift anything this way at all. Like I had no power to lift anything. Of all the dumb stuff we've done, I mean, obviously, just being <clears throat> on the road and stuff, is it something where you get older that stuff happens more often? Like why that moment? I'm sure you've done worse than worse situations where you could have really torn your arm off mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't happen. So like, why do you think that? Is it just old age or just like the years of neglect on? actually you not listening to the signs of your body going hey dude yeah i mean it's coming i'm super hard-headed i mean i i i push my you know you know I, I i'm actually this is ironic because i've been having a conversation with myself about pushing myself more in the workouts now like i i've kind of backed off i've gained some weight you know um but kind of bad weight of course <laughs> uh I don't push myself. I still work out every, you know, every show day and all of that, but I don't push myself as much with cardio as I used to. And so I just gotten back into talking to myself about like, Hey, man, we're going to start pushing ourselves again. And like, we're going to get, we're going to get really back in shape, which I'm, I'm still dedicated to doing, but because that's the way my brain is, um, I just push through everything all the time. And I think that I can accomplish whatever I want to accomplish and I don't need any help and I can do it myself. And, um, just having that kind of mindset. I think that's probably more what it is than anything. I mean, so we, we, we were, we're updating the recording studio, some, some stuff in here. I actually had, uh, Andy and Justin were here, uh, the whole week. Andy's our front of house engineer. Justin's our front of house tech. Um, both of them are like mad scientists, genius people. Just Justin, dude, Justin is a super, like a the one like one of the oh, sweetest yeah. dudes ever but sweetest guy ever but like really 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 fucking smart like really yeah. smart no and he can um, party he can party and, hard it's awesome ooh, yeah it's awesome uh but uh no man he you know but, but anyway we were here doing that and that that's why i was going to get the countertop because i uh i was moving some stuff around in here and redoing some things but um yeah man i i think that that you know look i you know what was interesting, I told the doctor that, that the prior to the injury, the last couple of workouts that I'd done, like I was doing overhead presses and it felt like I had to push harder with this arm than this arm for some reason. Now, that's not the same motion. Like the tendon is a pulley. It's like this kind of pulling motion, right? 
but there was something weak in there, I think, anyway. And um, it was probably time, you know, it, it was time for it to go. And it went, it, le it left the chat. Um, like Did they put you on medication or is this all like just you, surgery, and then just clean kind of yeah, heal? Well, they, well they, so they've given me... They've given me some some meds, but I don't really like taking that stuff. I'm I'm I've taken it a couple of times because it is really super painful right now. Um, but uh, I kind of got uh, they gave me hydrocodone, and I had this thing with hydrocodone at one point in my life where like I really enjoyed it a lot, <laughs> and because uh, it, it made me feel like Superman, and uh, you know it, I was high all the time on it, and it felt great, and so. When I took it the other day, I was like, "Oh, I remember this. I remember why I, you know, why I like doing this." Uh, but, and I'm actually, I took some today, so I'm on it right now. Uh, I, but I'm trying not to to get too used to it. But you know, I, I didn't take any this morning. Like, in fact, I hadn't really been taking it until the second half of the day, and I didn't take any today until they took this wrap off because the wrap had a brace, like a support in it, it kept my arm bent like this, and. You know, the whole idea is to get this thing moving some. So I'm supposed to move it around some slowly, you know, during the day. Um, but man, when they took the oh. when, they, when they took the thing off. So something that, that was interesting when it happened, when the injury happened, I mean it was it was it was brutal. It was like nauseating sounding. Like when it went, it was like, oh, I knew instantaneously what exactly what had happened. It was like, you know, figured it out. I got the piece of wood like into the truck. And I got into the truck, I turned the, the, the car on and turned the AC on full blast in my face. And like, I'm usually really good with pain. Like you've been around me before. We've talked about yeah, this before. Yeah. Like I, you know, like, I mean, I can get through painful things and like, you know, deal with it and whatever. And I'm sure every, everyone can. I mean, I'm yeah. not like, like special in that way, but like, you know, um, I can usually push through pain pretty well. But for some reason, man, this thing, like I went into the worst shock I've ever gone into, like from an injury ever. And uh, my ears, like I almost went deaf. Like I was start, this rumble like started happening in my ears and I was about to faint and I kept thinking I was going to pass out. And then I started vomiting and Jesus. like I, uh, I, I called, uh, I called Kelly and I was like, Hey, I, you know, this is what's happened. Um, you know, can you and Justin or somebody come get me and, you know, drive so he can drive the truck back and I need to go, I need to go to the hospital or a doctor or something. And, um, but like I'm talking to her and then the next thing I know, my phone rings and I had passed out <laughs> like, like oh. while I was talking to her, she's calling me back. She's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. So interestingly enough today, I'm just telling you that because today when I got the, the thing taken off and the, the, the nurse who was, or the PA who was taking the, the, the bandage off was like making me bend my arm. I started to feel faint again. Like it was like, I don't know if it's just that where that nerve is in there or something, or if it's like, it's just that painful. But, um, I, uh, so I did, I took a little bit of, uh, took a little bit of hydrocodone when I left the doctor's office because it was, you know, it's just, uh, I guess if it's there to help me, I guess I should let it help me. I just can't get too used to it. <laughs> I, can't well, get, the, I can't get back into it, I guess. The reason the why I was wondering is because recently my dad had a uh, UTI. And, like It messes with the brain and stuff. And oh, he's, having, he's having these crazy, the medication was giving these crazy lucid dreams, mm -hmm. which ties into something we asked uh, a couple weeks oh, ago yeah. about, we never got to talk about, but it, I, was, well, I was wondering with you, and everything we've been talking about with the dream stuff, where if you do that vacation, you sleep one night, you just wake up in some, inside a volcano with fucking Bodor and fucking oh, doing the rig shit. No, I, I, man, I, my, the color has left my, I mean, this, is, this sounds so artistic, but the color has left my dreams. Like, I don't, I don't, I used to have really vivid dreams, like a lot. And I used to, uh, we've talked about before, I used to have like the sleep paralysis thing, like lucid dreaming or whatever, where I could like, um, and and I could uh, I could like feel myself floating and you know kind of and you can sort of command for certain things in that realm. It's very interesting, um, but that stuff doesn't happen anymore. And I used to say that the lucid dream stuff happened. It would only happen when I was relaxed, and that's true. Like if I was in a really relaxed part of my life or like things were just kind of chill, then that stuff would would could. It, and I I wasn't one of these people that could make it happen. I could feel it coming on and like sort of cause it to happen if I felt it coming on, if that makes sense. But like, I can't, you know, put myself in that state or anything, but that hasn't happened in, it's been years, man, 
it's been years since that happened. And I guess maybe I'm just not relaxed anymore or something, but, but even regular dreams, like I don't, I don't really remember. That's why that one night we were talking about was so interesting, you know? Yeah. If you could kind uh, of explain why we asked that and how we all kind of had that weird realization that morning going, Holy yeah, shit, I, we all slept like crap. Yeah. You're going to have to remind me the details. Cause it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I wish we had gotten to do one of these like right after that. Cause that was like, it was top of mind. Yeah. Right? So this is what you had the, uh, we we were in the lobby grabbing coffee. Kelly was there, yep. Barry, a bunch of us, and you were like, you were talking about how you had a shitty night of sleep. Yep. And then I then I was like, yeah, I had one too. And then you guys went to play go play top golf that day. And then you were talking with Paul's Paul, our merch guy's yeah. friend. So, yeah. What, what, so so what I, I so we were down in the lobby. I forget what show it was. We were, it was toward the end of that last tour. I think we were like in Virginia or Pennsylvania or something. One of the, one of those last it was Virginia, right? Virginia. Yeah. Um. And yeah, Kelly and I come down to the lobby and we were just talking about whatever I'd had. A, I'd had a really, really bad night's sleep um, where what happened with me was I was laying in bed watching TV. And then like this wave of depression came over me, like like heavy, very instantaneously went from being, OK, I'm just I'm watching TV. Everything's fine to suicidal ideation and like just why am i here there's no point in this and my wife's right here laying in the bed next to me she's come out to see me i should be really happy uh and then that night i had this dream that brent and i had this like intense like physical fist fight like i forget what it was all about but like he and i like went at each other like bloodied each other up for some reason like, very vivid like full of color and everything. And that's, and again, that's not usually what happens with me. So anyway, I just kind of, you know, I don't know how it came up, but it was you and Barry were down there. And I, I meant, maybe I mentioned something or Barry mentioned something about he, Barry will usually go, man, this hotel's weird. Like, I think maybe that's what it was. This hotel's weird. I didn't sleep well last night. I said, me either. And then you said me either. And it was very interesting how, like, everything was very similar, like what we were describing. Like, you had a very vivid dream. Barry had a very vivid, bad dream and yeah very anger there's like anger attached to her like a, a sense of like dread yeah and then the, and 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 again there was there was other uh um uh i had another conversation with somebody else who said they were like i had this crazy dream last night that that uh that i was being abducted or something and then paul our our uh Got uh, Rich, Rich Paul, Paul Domingo, yeah, yeah, Paul Dominguez, uh, seemingly unknown podcast. Paul, uh, what he he's he goes, dude. He goes, my friend texted me this this morning or last night or whatever or this morning and showed me the text message from his friend who lives in Arizona, and she said that she had uh, a dream that somebody was coming to steal her kids, like a nightmare that somebody was coming to steal her kids, and she was on the run. And it was, it was a lot more to it than that, but it was very vivid. I've, and then, and this, that's why I asked the question and you asked the question. I was like, Hey, did anybody else have any weird, weird dreams last night? And dude, this stuff flooded in. Like yeah. I've got, I've got so many things that I could read on my phone and, and maybe if I can dig back and find them, I should. Um, but, and, and people I know, people I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, my text messages filled up with people saying the same thing. Um, I had, uh, 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 a member of our of our crew's wife hit me up and she goes, I had a dream that there was a doctor who was trying to steal my eggs so that he that like I could have his children or something. Like like all this crazy stuff, man. Like these people are having these crazy vivid dreams. And then other people talking about these waves of depression. Mm -hmm. Like without me, I didn't describe we didn't just I didn't want any I didn't Correct. tell anybody what to put, right? We just asked. Did anybody have any any unusual sleep last night and that was all it was and people start just and all so many people described the same things right that it that it started to become really creepy and it started to make me feel funny like that night i remember because we went to top golf that night like we're supposed to be out like having fun and hanging out and like i'm feeling weird all night because i'm wondering i'm going like is this uh uh you know so <laughs> I showed John and Barry and everybody this, this, uh, th th you can find these videos on, on YouTube. And, um, I guess you and I should, we should probably get better we, at like, pro providing this stuff. Well, right? we can, you we know, can have, people, but, uh, we'll have uh, Bando put in the video. 
But it's just there. There are a couple of different videos where uh, people are using satellite imagery uh, that, that usually tracks weather and that, those sort of things, like weather satellites and whatever, are tracking these microwave radiation bursts coming out of of all the major cities and out of odd places like White White Sands, New Mexico, and but like these these microwave radiation bursts that are emanating at night and then they start getting to be then they'll like Diminish. let's say the first hypothetically let's say the first night they they start at 7 30 in at night and they go through 7 30 in the morning then the next night like they're on a timer they start at 8 30 at night and go till 8 30 in the morning so it's like it's it's very choreographed and then the night after that they start at 9 30 at night and go till 9 30 in the morning and these bursts of microwave radiation last for 12 hours at a time and you can see them you know they're visible on the on the imaging um and so i started one i'm like is that what this is is it like you know are we are we being you know are we being pulsed and and uh inundated with with you know pulses and radiation and stuff like that as a test you know right. i mean you know I, I i don't know if i go as far as to say mind control type stuff but it's it's interesting right well like we uh, going through the pandemic uh, like the super conspiracy theory stuff, uh, like the five G and the vaccines, and like how they're trying to like everyone kind of react to. Right. I, mean, I don't know enough about that. I love the topic and discussing it because it's so yep. out there, crazy. But what if there is something to like everyone? And I forgot who I was talking to with the Motley Crue band. You do a John or Tommy, and we're talking about uh, when these. I think it, was, it had to have been Tommy. Like we're talking about these this this one tribe back in the day uh that would like they'd all do like this drug the hallucinogen drug and try and t be on the same wavelength together and try and connect whether it was their ancestors or whatever it was but they're all like kind of one like hive mind yeah and we're kind of like thinking of, like how crazy would be if they actually tried controlling our minds today but in a not in a good way almost like a weaponizing that's what thoughts. I'm talking about. And then the other thing that I thought about too, and by the way, I'm like looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm back in all these messages that I got, man. And it's, 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 I've probably got, I got look 50, 60. And people, I probably got, well, I've probably got 200 or 300 of them. And people are here. just like, I normally don't dream like this, or this is the weirdest, yes. most memorable night. Like yeah. if you'd asked me this last year, give me a vivid dream. I couldn't do it. Yeah. But if you told asked me a year from now and said I, you, they would all said I could tell you exactly how this my mind felt that night. Yeah. So it uh but like and again, man, this could be like a like a confirmation bias sort of thing where it's like only the people who had a bad night's sleep answered me, right? You know, it's like the people who didn't I had some people who said no, no problem. I didn't have any issues. So you're only getting the people who had but you know, bad experience. The other thing we have, but, where we, yeah, where those people live, where those pulses are closer or further away from. Well, they, so it it basically emanates out of any highly popu high population areas, right? You can see, right. it, like we'll we'll find it and, and throw it up so you can see what we're talking about. Um, and uh, but the other thing I thought about too is it like is is it was it like um, you know, like like we talked we've talked about this before before nine eleven happened that that you know that, that there was a measurable change in in uh, people's behavior like a day before, two days before, you know, and uh, a lot of people in here, by the way, said I felt like something bad is about to happen. That was the other thing that got me too, and that's kind of like that's when I'm talking about the dread and the and the depression and all that stuff. That was sort of like that thing. It was like, and then that that next day. I felt this dread all day. I, mean, I think the dread was maybe more created by me because I was weirded out by this whole thing. But, um, but yeah, but, but the measure, like, like something that's a measurable change in, in, in society as a whole before a major event takes place, like a major bad event, you know? And so, you know, for a couple of days there, I was like waiting on like a shoe to drop, you know, like there's going to be a nuclear attack or there's going to be a, you know, um, a, uh, uh, an EMP or, or there's right. gonna be a chemical thing or something. And, and, you know, you and I've been talking about that stuff anyway, just because of the state of the world and, Correct. and, you know, people that we know who, who, who are maybe in the know about certain things that say certain things and bring up certain things. And, you know, or, uh, so, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it was just, it was a very strange 24 hours, man, 48 hours, whatever. Um, and then, you know, the, the interesting thing was, man, that the next night, 
I slept like a baby. I mean, like, and it could have been because I didn't sleep the night before, right? But, like, I slept hard. And here's something else we talked about, too, is remember what I, at the end of, uh, uh, no, it wasn't the end of the last, when we were driving, we we played in Reno, and then we drove back to Sacramento to fly. Yes. Remember yeah, that? Th- that night, yeah. Okay. I we we thought that drive from Reno to Sacramento was only going to be a couple hours. It ended up being a little longer. And I remember I was up in the front lounge with Paul and Brent. And Brent goes, he goes, man, we still got another hour and thirty minutes to to go. And I was like, you know what, man, I'm going to lay down on my bunk for an hour. You know, just yeah. just close just close my eyes until we get to the hotel. And I slept better. I, that's the most soundly I have slept. I'm I'm not kidding. That I like. That you know, people ask you to describe the best meal you ever ever ate. Like, that's how I feel about this this hour, fifteen minutes of sleep that I had. It was the most sound sleep that I've had in I think in a couple of years, and it was like blissful. I mean, I was just so comfortable, and like I did not want to like when we pulled into the hotel, I was like I felt like I'd been asleep for eight hours, and I was just and but one thing we talked about with that is we were rolling through. Oh like yeah, wilderness desert where where we didn't cell have phones it, weren't working. We yeah. we had no cell service. Like, there were no towers. There was nothing going on, and I started wondering. I'm like, I wonder if that's if I slept so well because there was no interference. Like there was nothing. Well, like, we were supposed to do Joshua Tree, that whole like Pioneer uh, Town. That oh one yeah, time. yeah, yeah. But, like obviously the the plane shit all got hacked and whatever. Travels yeah. got delayed, but. To your point, like I, that was such a great night of sleep too. That's such a dead zone in terms of like, oh, Joshua, Joshua Tree. Yeah, yeah, like uh, Yucca Valley yeah. area. Yeah. I love it. It's it, there's a place in there called Pioneer Town that we love, and and it's it's uh we, where we did uh, most of the, well, all of the 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 pictures for, um, the initial pictures for for uh, Plan Zero. Um, Planet Zero were all done up there in the desert, the high, kind of the high desert area up there in Joshua Tree and and some of it in uh Palm Springs too. But uh but yeah, man, like you get away from the you get away from the um from the from the being in, inundated by frequency. Because we're surrounded by all this microwave radiation all the time now. Because, you know, it's just it's everywhere. It's coming out of this right now, it's coming to and from this. It's emanating from towers. It's emanating from, you know, any, if nothing else, electromagnetic interference all the time. And so it it's um, it was just interesting that I slept like memorably <laughs> better than I have in years over the course of an hour and a half where we were rolling through desert that had no cell service whatsoever. Right. Is that yeah. why do you think there's a lot more sightings with like the pair, like the uh, UFO type stuff in those type of areas? Like it's it either seems like it's either rural areas or like less populated dense areas well, as opposed well, to like city. I mean, honestly, man, if I had to think, it would just be because if I was trying to stay hidden covert, or, covert yeah. about what I'm doing, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna open myself up over the cities. I, you know, I I think that that when that you know when those UFOs appeared over Washington D.C. back in the day, I think that was purposeful. I think that was a signal because like we were messing around with nuclear weapons and yeah. and uh, uh, I think that was like a sign. That was like a, hey, <laughs> you know, stop what you're doing. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, and then, and dude, so that's, uh, so if anybody has any any comments about that stuff, I mean, I'm, I'm still interested in what happened that night. That was, uh, that was, uh, what date? Because we got the date wrong when we asked people, right? <laughs> Initially, what was correct. It? Let me let me see. Uh, uh, let's see. What did we say? It was on uh, uh, seven thirty one. So July thirty first was the night, and uh, it was just really strange. So if anybody, if anybody else experienced anything strange on on July twenty, July thirty first, rather that night, I'd be really interested, man, because it seemed like just from where we sit it was it was it was not a very localized thing i mean these were people all over the world that were yeah. they were hitting they were hitting us up about how but it it was it was mainly in the us but there were there were other people as well so and someone else mentioned something interesting too so it could have been a like a solar flare event i mean you know we don't really think about how you know how 
because we're, we're so insular here on earth like we think oh it's just you know we're 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 in our little bubble and everything life takes place in this bubble but all the other forces from outside of the earth that are acting on us too like uh like solar flares or or you know it could have been a uh um uh you know like like if a if a if a star goes supernova or something those those gravitational waves you know make their way uh, over us you know right. it could have happened you know it could be from way out and it could be very subtle you just never know what that stuff does to 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 our brains who knows does, does it also feel like right now especially this time of history with assassination attempts missing assassins bodies uh <laughs> the dnc yeah. rnc politics global war popping up everywhere it just seems like everything's coming to a head like a boil for the first time in my life i feel completely unsure of what direction I mean, I know how the world should go. I, th I think most people want a very peaceful uh, whatever, but it just feels like there's so much anger and hate in the world right now that it's mm -hmm. going to come to a head, and I don't know if that head is something they're trying to manufacture with the chaos. Oh, it seems it seems like manufactured chaos for sure. I mean, you know, the way that we're we're told to think about each other and what we're told to think about each other and, and, and you know, where we're pitted against each other and um you know i i definitely uh i definitely think that that's manufactured but the, i i also feel like i hmm it's manufactured from a human perspective and i'm going to get all spiritual of course but from a spiritual perspective um it it, it could just be you know the, those the people that are manufacturing it could be being used to manufacture and to so you know to so dissent and and uh you know, to, to have us get at each other. Uh, you know, but man, look, I look back at the sixties, late sixties were very, very much like what we're going through right now with upheaval and turmoil and, and people being unsure of things. Um, for me, the difference, if I had to look at it between the like 1965 to 70 and 2020 through right now, um, is, when you talk about how you're unsure, I think it's for me, rather than just saying unsure, it's I, for the first time in my life, I'm positive that the people who are in control do not have mine or you, your, or our best interest in mind. Right. So it makes you unsure because you're like all the gloves, all bets are off and all the gloves are off. Like the mask has come off, you know? Yeah. And and it's just it it's it's uh we're not even hiding who we are anymore we don't care about you we don't really have the best interest of america or the world or whatever in mind it's solely about us and we are willing to kill maim steal destroy you know rape pillage whatever yeah. we have to do to get what we want and to, and to have the things that we want and to have the, you know, to have a world where we're in control, you know? And now that's a, as a, as a person who lives in the Western world, this is the first time I can, you know, th it feels this way. There are people in other parts of the world who are living that's, that reality now, right, you every know, day, and, the whole life, and, yeah. and, 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 and people in other countries, the, the former other countries that were formerly like that as well. Um, so, again this is just from an american perspective more than anything is is really feeling like for the first time in my lifetime that it whereas before it's always like you could look at things through a lens of um you know x y and z are off the table because no one's going to let x y and z happen because x y and z are bad for our country x y and z are bad for the people you know so yeah. so there, we have people that are going to fight for us and those things aren't going to happen. Now that's not the case anymore. Now it's just like, yeah, the people are, are expendable and it's just out there now. It's like, yeah, we don't really, you know, we're going to say all the right things still, but when the rubber meets the road, we don't do any of the things we say. We don't do any of the things, any of the things we talk about. And we're just going to let whatever happened, happen. Right. I mean, just like if you, <laughs> if you put, uh, and again, I'm not picking a, again, you know, this is not a political statement. This is just an observation of what's been going on, you know, is, uh, 
you know the uh uh it looks it looks it looks sort of like we might go to war with iran right if iran attacks israel we're going to go to war with iran well it doesn't take a, a a neurosurgeon rocket scientist to go back a few years and go oh well barack obama and joe biden did send 480 billion dollars to iran just shipped the money yeah just send them like no reason for it no no there was never a reason given there was never a um it's just yeah okay. we're going to give them four 480 billion dollars yeah. that they've used to build up their military that they've used to fund the houthis and the and the uh um uh uh what are some of the other Anyway, the other factions that are Correct. attacking Israel, because we probably wanted them to attack Israel, because we knew that eventually they would attack Israel, and what you know, Hamas and the Houthis and all that, and and, and then, of course, Israel is going to fight back, and then we've got a war that we can get into. Like it doesn't. That, that's not a lot. It's not a big stretch to look at. Like those funds were sent for that purpose. Those funds were sent probably to plant the seeds for future well, conflicts. And and, and 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 look, it's, it's and, and if you're thinking that way, it's probably not a far stretch to go. The conversation was probably had between our country and Iran. Like, yeah, here, use this money. We know what you're going to do with it. You know, it's good for business, <laughs> you know, and here, here's some money to go destroy Israel while at the same time we're supposed to be allies of Israel, right? It's, it, that's not a, that's not a, a wild concept. And if you, and back to the original point being, that's not for the greater good of anybody. There, there, there's no, there are no adults in the room. There right. are, there are zero adults in the room. Right. And it, it is, it is, you know, GI Joe with real life. That's what, and, and so that creates this dis-ease and discomfort in people. It's probably why none of us slept the other night, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, man, if, if they're doing that with, if they're giving $480 billion to, uh, um, you know, to, to Iran, uh you know to 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 do whatever with what are they doing what are they spending on money on in, inside of our country to do to people you know to to mess with things i mean that's why like you know them sending out microwave radiation bursts if 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 this, if this were a thing that uh, there's a program in the in the black budget of our government that we're going to every night certain nights we're going to send out microwave radiation pulses to the mass public, you know, in all of the high population areas of our country and see what it does to people. See if it turns them into raging idiots. See what, see, see if the next day, do, 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 do car accidents increase? Do murders increase? Do, do they decrease? Like, you know, carrying out these, 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 I mean, you look at MK Ultra, they, they, our government has never had any problem at all experimenting on its citizens to to correct you know ever so they didn't all of a sudden grow a spine you know um well they're trying to grow another spine on someone else <laughs> right but so but with all of that being said even knowing like and, and i didn't know about mk ultra back in the day but i do now but even like knowing that those things existed i still felt like there was some sort of of with our leadership I hate that word. With our politicians, there was there was there was some sort of self preservation in there where they weren't going to let certain things go down. Right? There were certain things that were off the table, you know, and uh, that's all gone now. And by the way, this is not a Barack Obama bashing session, but one thing he did, and this explains a lot too. And this is not a this doesn't take a lot of brain power to figure out what's going on. That. There was a law that was signed in, uh, and I don't remember when it was, but I believe it was early, uh, early 20th century, that the United States government and uh, uh, along with, with media, it was illegal to propagandize American citizens. So it was against the law. Whether they tried to do it, there's always there's always gonna be some level of propaganda. But what I'm saying is, is our government could not propagandize its people like what was done in the in in the Soviet Union and you know in communist China, you know where or, or North Korea, like it's illegal. And uh, that 
Barack Obama let that law expire. It had an expiration on it where it had to be re-upped or re-voted on or something. I don't remember the details. Do your own. It, it was either that or he abolished it. I don't remember which. So we need to look that up. Maybe we can figure that out. But um, so as of the end of his presidency, it became legal for the U.S. government to propagandize its citizen. Look at everything that's gone on since then. Right. How we're at each other's throats. We're told no one misinformation is the is the hot button word. Fake news, all this stuff. Well, that's another word for fake news. It's propaganda. It's like you're you everything is a psyop now. Like everything is a psyop. Right. I mean, uh, what was it? Uh you can find this too. There's a meme somewhere out there right now where someone just took all the headlines from I think it was Friday and it was like someone had sent out a mockingbird media type shit where someone had sent out a use this buzzword today. Yeah. And the buzzword was joy, right? Kamala Harris is bringing joy to her campaign. And dude, it wasn't just the headlines that said Kamala Harris, joy, 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 joy. It was then everyone talking and they're all saying the word. It's propaganda. It's a psyop. You're being psyoped into this stuff. You know, it's like these talking points go out and, and everyone parrots them. And that used to be illegal. That was not like your government couldn't send out, you know, I guess they could send out talking points. Will, will you please say this? But again, the, 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 the fact that it's legal to propagandize people now, like it, it's legal to fuck with us. Right. Now, it's not that our government didn't always do some form of that, but like not on this mass scale. And I think that's I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the 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 discontentment and the 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 stuff that you were asking about that we were talking about you know like like the feeling of of just not knowing where we're going or what's going to happen next because it, it really is so strike I, the last like couple of days i spent uh, i got a bunch of friends in chicago area and stuff the dnc there and seeing the stuff on twitter and stuff like that and then talking to people on the ground there like law enforcement stuff and they people laugh. It's like there are pallets of bricks being dropped off in certain neighborhoods and stuff. Chicago, the DNC. And the last time it was in the DNC, the DNC was in Chicago. I think sixty-eight or seventy-eight. Ton of violence. Obviously, to that time yep. period, it seemed like a lot. Now they're just being close to hundred thousand people. Antifa, all these groups and stuff showed up. All this stuff being dropped off and specific signage that is yep. very what all connected. And it's just you see that it's like you can't even. Like my first thought is there is something bad going to happen this week, whether it's to blame one other party side, the Trump side, or to not get rid of Kamala or to just create more chaos where there's not an election. Or like, I mean, yeah. I should, our first, my first thought should not be that. It should be like, you know what? Democrat party is doing their thing. Love it. L let's just pray for yeah. peace and yes. safety and whatever your message is. Do it safely without making someone feel like shit or telling someone they're wrong because they think differently. And right. now you see all this stuff. It's like, man, I just pray there's not more violence or looting. I mean, it's Chicago, so what do you expect, right? <laughs> but it's just like it's it's just it's a, such a weird, dreadful feeling to me. Yeah, man. I mean, it it's that dreadful is a great word for how. And I, here's the thing, man. That feeling is not unique to you and me. I think that feeling of dread is for people on the right, left, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I think everyone feels this dread. And this is taking us back to that dream thing that night. Like, why was there this feeling of dread that night? And, and you know, it it's, again, the propaganda that's been pushed out there has got, you know, look, you and I are guilty of this a lot, right? Where we, where we think that, that maybe the side that we agree less with has nothing but ill intent and correct is you know but there's propaganda wrapped up in that and just like my friends who are on the other side they feel like that you know the same thing from the right right the right is gonna is going to to ruin everything and if donald trump gets in power then we're all fucked <laughs> or if Kamala Harris gets in power, we're, we're all, all fucked. fucked. Right. And it's that's where we live now. We live in that place where it's like Right. I don't I I I want to think that none of that is true. I want to think that 
that we're not fucked no matter what. Right. Because, you know, Brent says something every night during the show and, and I hope people don't think it's campy because I really believe it is we have a lot more in common than we, than we do than, than differences. You know, we're a lot more similar than different. We all believe in the same things more than, than we believe, we believe in more together than we, than we, uh, Then we don't. I guess right. as, as it, I'm, you know, sorry, I'm loopy right now. You have yeah. to pardon me. My brain's not working. Uh, but we do, man. We have a lot more. In, I think. I think that as a people, we really do. I think. I think we all want what, what, what we're talking about. We all want to go to sleep at night and feel like, okay, the 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 people that are in charge have at least got our collective best interest in mind. Yeah. Are they going to miss things on each one of us? Yeah. It, we're, there are always going to be issues. Right. You know, there are always going to be hot button issues that not one, that, that one person or one group is not going to be able to satiate for all the, for everyone. You know, you can't please everybody all the time, but that's why we're a representative Republic. And that's why we can vote for people who can represent us in those ways. But, um, you know, I, th I think that everyone, th this feeling of, 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 of dread and the fact that we have, we have experienced we're it's, and it's ramping up too. This is why, this is why I think this psyop thing is such a real thing and why I think we're being fucked with because more once in a lifetime events have come and gone in the past oh. four months, you know, like, and they just fly by. It's like, we don't talk about them anymore. You know what the 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 attempted assassination was what not like a month ago yeah maybe, and and it's gone it's like out of the news nobody talks about it anymore it's fucking done we're 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 done with that we're on to the next thing, and then you know the next big event's gonna happen and we'll talk about that for a, for a few days and then we'll move on from that. Then too. there'll be a tornado that destroys half the country. We'll move on yeah. from there a couple months and then there'll sure. be a, a war breaks out and no one cares and then oh, I think yeah, yeah. The, the funniest about the whole thing is. I worked with Obama. So anyone that knows me knows I'm obviously super conservative. I don't agree with everything, but I'm that type of a very blue collar conservative. Right. Um, and but when I worked with Obama for close to eight years, people's perception was like, "Oh, how'd you work with that asshole?" It's like, you know what? That guy is actually cool as fuck. Yeah. Like, and like as a human being, I never saw him be anything less than a stellar father, husband, friend. And while I don't agree with a lot of the policies. I think people always assume that, oh, you just can't work with that. And I think to your point, we can all work together. We don't have to agree, whatever. But if you're a genuinely good person, mm -hmm. I don't know why we can't do that. So it's like I never looked at him. It was like, oh, you liberal mother, you right. Democrat. I mean, I was, again, some of the stuff I saw and was a part of, I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. We're talking <laughs> about this in 15 years. Yeah. But I'm also like, this is just a, this is a flawed human being like all of us are. Yeah. That if you, if you think one man or woman can control their nation, you're all wrong. Like this is a big organization that pulls the strings here and there. Um, but people are like, how'd you work with that asshole? It's like, well, hold on a second. He wasn't a bad guy. Never yeah. did anything wrong to me. So it's just, well, I don't know. I wish we could all kind of get agree to disagree in a peaceful, like harmony. You know, you, uh, you and I know this just from, the people we work around and meet is, you know, you get one impression of somebody or a group of people from other people. And then you get the actual view of that person or people when you're with them. Right. right. And around them. Right. And it's very, it's very rare when those things meet, like when they actually work out to be the same thing. I've had it happen. Uh, but uh, it's usually that, you know, the, the, the person that you're, let's just use Barack Obama for an example, you know, um, it's easy to make a boogeyman out of, out of anybody. It really is, yeah, man. Right. Like if, if you need a boogeyman, you can pretty much make a boogeyman out of anybody. Um, and I, I think that, that sometimes when you get in front of that person who's supposed to be the boogeyman, it's like, Oh, you're not at all that. Right. You know? Um, and we, We've just we you know the, the, these terms like dehumanizing or othering each other has become it's become a real thing like where it's not like uh you know it's us and them it's 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 no pun intended but it's it's you know we're othering everyone else it's like 
you know uh and dude there are so many pieces of shit in your circle that you don't even know about that you, or you choose not to say i'm saying your circle meaning your side if we're talking about politics here we're talking about right and left right now is basically what i'm talking about and dude there are plenty of pieces of shit in the right and there are plenty of pieces of shit in the left and plenty of great wonderful people more more great and wonderful people on on either side of that than than not but we view everyone else as the problem you know the, everyone else is you know oh you're the problem you're the problem you're the problem you know you see it all the time on on uh, on on i see it all the time on instagram where someone's like uh someone's complaining about something you know it's like well you voted for that you deserve it you know and it's like well, no one knew what they were voting for, man. Like we're, we're talking about politicians here. We're talking about people that 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 you know probably don't have the best morals, you know. So we're we're all voting, hoping the great things are going to happen. Right. Like that's every time I vote. Give I'm me voting, twenty percent of what you said that I agree with. <laughs> every 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 time that I vote, I'm voting. I'm 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 voting with hope. I'm hoping that that this is going to change something. That there's going to be a change, or that this person who I'm you know, although I'm given a binary choice, usually this person who I'm, 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 you know, elevating to a position is going to be the one that, that unites everyone and brings everybody together and does great things for everyone. Not just for me, you know, um, that's usually not the case. Usually you're voting for somebody that just wants to get in there and they've got the title and they are going to do whatever they have to do to get elected again the next time. And then after they get elected again the next time, whatever they have to do to get a book deal and make a bunch of money and retire off into the sunset somewhere. Yeah. That's who you're voting for. And so the fact that we put so much right now, our entire country is politically charged behind two groups of people, two people, but two groups of people who think like, like what I just said, you know, and we're holding them up as these great hopes of like, please, for God's sakes, do something great when they really don't probably don't care too much about doing great things, you know? Right. They just want the recognition and they, you know, because dude, there's such a giant machine behind all of that. That's taking care of the actual work most of the time. Yeah. I don't know. I, maybe I'm not making any sense today. One but... of the, you're actually asleep. You're still on that bus ride to Sacramento. I'm, I might still be in, Sac the, in Sacramento. Uh, one of the things I have noticed, so with that sense of dread, like when it comes to like my create re, my creativity, whether it's like the poems, like the short story stuff, or like this other thing I'm working on, I have found it's easier for me to go to like the dark places I need to go for these dark stuff because yeah. I'm in that mood where I don't. If the way I'm feeling now with the world. You, if you put a gun to my head and said, "Hey, write the happiest thing you could write right now," I'm sure I could do it, but it'd be a struggle. Mm -hmm. Like for you, do you have you noticed where it's like this type of feeling has kind of affected your like creative process? Like if you guys were in the studio today, and Brett's like, "Hey, we're gonna write a really happy song about joy," well, I and, yeah. But like, you would well, probably he, be he, like, he, "He's he, he's he's kind of wanting to do that anyway," and I'm just like, "I don't know if I got that in me, man." So, but is that, I mean, so is, is it, you think that's a true, is, is it, like the power of like the creative mindset where it's like, you have to be in that right mindset to be creative and be successful in the creativity. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't, I can't feign happiness to, to write a happy song. I mean, it's, right. it's, but I mean, I've written happy songs before and like, of but course. I had to be in the mood to do it, but I, I don't know, man, there's something, um, um, I, I think if, and again, I, you know, I'm in danger. I, I can think of examples that aren't this, but I just, I just feel like if you look at great art throughout time, most of it did not come from a happy place. Correct. Most of it came from a very painful place and a tortured place. And there's something honest about that. There's, there's, there's honesty in depression. There's honesty in, in dread. There's honesty in Loss. torment. Yeah torment you know there's honesty in 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 when something's eating at you and eating your eating your soul eating your happiness you know you have no choice but to honestly meet that thing head on or meet it on meet it on the battlefield right um whereas is happiness is easy to fake you can't really fake 
dread and unhappiness and all that. So it's which, very honest. It's which, very honest. Yeah, which I think the other day I was talking to someone about Robin Williams, where he made everyone else so happy, but that darkness inside of him drove. Um, it. Drove. I mean, obviously, you got the health issues too. But again, the part of the mental idea of that. He was a hurting human being. The, the first thought when he woke up was, I got to make that sick kid happy or mm-hmm. dress up. And it's like these people that are good at that are like deep down, they're like, they have to suppress like the actual, it's it's such a fascinating thing to me. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be, I, I hate to talk about super sad shit, man, but like, look, man, you know, like I have days, you know, a lot of days where I wake up in the morning and I'm just like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. why am I here? What is the point in this? You know, I have days where I wake up and the first thought is something super dark, like literally open my eyes and it's like shockingly dark thoughts, you know? And the days that I'm able to sort of um, work my way around that enough to to get moving and to, um, you know, to take positive steps to, toward getting myself out the door and, and, and moving, then I, I kind of, I have no choice, but to meet those things head on. I have no choice, but to, to slay that dragon somehow. And the only way that I can do that is by writing down how that affects me, how that, like, like, how have I been affected by this today? How does this feel today? And look, man, I know that sometimes it ends up with the subject matter of songs being a lot the same. But, um, you know, I, I can't just, you know, I guess I just don't, I don't work in a medium where that works for me, you know, where I can just, where I can be a Robin Williams. I do. I wish that I could take, and, but I, I can't say that we're not making people happy though. I guess I'm making people happy and I'm helping people. Um, but it would be nice to see people. And I guess I do make people smile. I guess I don't really think about it that way. But you know, a song like like Monsters or 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 you know, uh, Symptom of Being Human or something. I don't know. I just don't really consider those to be happy songs. But but you know, man, look. Then I look at somebody like Bob Ross. Right? Bob Ross was like he made everybody happy, and he seemed to be a really happy dude. And if you watch the documentaries, he was like a genuinely happy person. Yes, Mister Rogers. And, and and made this and made both of these people making great art that helped people. Yeah. Um, in a positive way. It just sucks that that's in such short supply. Um, you know, and I hope it's not because we don't pay attention to it. I hope it's because, I hope that it's not because there are people out there trying to do that and we're just not seeing it because we don't want to see it because everyone is depressed and down. Um, well, I think people take that for art for granted because I remember growing up watching the Bob Ross stuff. And what's weird you brought that up is my dad's literally doing a Bob Ross puzzle right now. That's it's, awesome, man. Yeah, I love it. I'm just like, holy shit. But, yeah. uh, so and we always watched that show growing up as a kid. But I yeah. think I think we take advantage of the fact that or take for granted that one day that art we love is gonna, not going to be here any longer. And I remember watching it the last last time on PBS and then boom, it's I never saw it again until Netflix started doing the reruns again. But yeah, I, maybe we just take that shit for granted where we, we don't, yeah. we just think that's to be our, our calming voice. And then one day it's just, it's gone. Well, again, man, I, you know, I don't mind being woo woo and weird about this shit, but like, if you think about the fact, that's the fact, if you think about the concept, I can, I think this is probably more factual than not that. And we, 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 we brought this up before, but if, if we are infinite beings, we're infinite souls, we're, we are, we are, we are beings of goodness and, and we have the potential in a spiritual way to occupy all the spaces in the universe at one time. And we are squeezed into these suits that we're wearing right now. Like it's uncomfortable. I've talked about this. Like, I feel like I'm wearing an uncomfortable suit, you know, a lot of the time. Like this isn't like, this can't be it. Like I remember, I I look around, I say that a lot. This, there's no way this is it. Right. You know, like I'm squeezed into this uncomfortable suit that I have to wear. And if everyone, if everyone is experiencing that, then everyone is kind of having some sort of, of existential, uh, um, not so positive crisis and and experience in their suits. And so that's why 
when someone writes something, Edgar Allan Poe writes something, you know, Stephen King writes something, uh, uh, Hemingway wrote something, da, da Vinci painted or, 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 uh, um, you know, Kurt Cobain or Eric Bass or Brent Smith or whatever, yeah. you know, when, when we, you know, I'm, I'm not comparing myself to da Vinci or Kurt Cobain, but I'm just saying when we You're create more the, yeah. the people, the, 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 the people that, yeah, I cut my, cut my <laughs> ligament out of my arm, my tendon out of my arm. Um, but when we create those things that are from a real place and they're not happy, I think that, that it rings, it resonates with everyone else though, because every, we are all having the same experience, however you want to look at it. And so the, you know, the, the, there are happy, great people out there, but I, but I feel like the human experience as a whole isn't always fucking fun happy love time you know it's like it's it's on a daily basis probably not as easy as we'd like to think it is and so when someone can describe that in words or put that into a painting or sing about it we gravitate toward it because it's like oh that person is experiencing what i'm experiencing um and we all need happy songs man we all need happy you know we go look i don't want to listen to to if I'm out at a wedding or something and we're <laughs> celebrating something, I don't want to listen to something sad, right? There, there's a time and a place for all the happy songs. We love the happy songs. Uh, I'm just talking about as far as writing a happy song goes. It's just not something that that I'm not saying I'll never be able to do it. And I like, again, I've done it before, and I'm not saying I'll never do it again. Uh, but you know, I have to. Me personally, I have to write about what I know and. You know, if that means that that I don't write many Shinedown songs anymore because I my subject matter is limited and, you know, maybe Brent's ready to write about some other things, then that's fine. I, I, I can't fake it. Yeah, I can't fake write about other stuff, man. I've tried, you know, and it just it's and not that I can't spit the words out. I can spit words out all day long. I can I can spit rhymes and words and things that sound sexy together and and all of that stuff. But like if I've got to get up and play it every night and and rep have it represent me, it's not something that I'm that I'm very good at. Right. And yeah. so I had spent like I think three days off in uh, North Dakota. I love North Dakota, but three days off in a city's tough. Um, but like <laughs> I, I I went met this they do like this street art show and I'd look at these local artist stuff and. I come across this guy and I, I took the picture of his car and stuff. Cause it's like, he, he was turning these old uh, metal pieces, almost like that guy we, you want, we, you should have bought in Europe that one time. I remember that. So he, he turns all these metal pieces from like lawnmowers cars into like animals. And he did like this big horse bust with like the screws for like the hair. Holy shit. It's, yeah. it's amazing. And I, I was going to get it, but I was like, they, he wasn't shipping and like it was wow. two, but I got his info. But like I realized that I found more joy doing that stuff a days off now than I would have when I first started my career traveling the world. It's like I don't know if it's like a uh, you grew up doing art kindergarten, first grade, second grade. You have to take an art class in high school, maybe or like at least woodworking or home economics. What felt like art, and then you kind of lose your your system. But as I got older now, I've realized I enjoy more time meeting these artists and seeing these people do shit I wish I could do. Mm. And some of it may be sure is stupid, like, or I don't get it. But I find joy in looking at this art now. Like, I'll do more museums now or stuff like that. I mean, we just did the Alamo Museum, uh, stuff like that, where you're kind of like, I want to see this type of history and art. Like, I want to like at least appreciate it before it one day gets taken down or censored. <laughs> or I, I, I do like that aspect of it. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I found myself becoming way more drawn to art and stuff like that the older I've gotten. Um, not that I, I guess maybe I didn't understand it when I was younger. I don't know. I, I wasn't that interested in it. Um, I had a lot of friends who were, like all my high school friends are all wildly intelligent gentlemen, um, way more intelligent than I am. And they were always, and they still are, uh, we, we're all still three, we're four of us are on a text chain together. Um, but, uh, they are all way more cultured than I am. Like half the time, like I, I am, you know what I feel like in our, in our text conversations, I'm the dumb redneck friend, like the rest of them, like they're always talking about jazz music or like, and they all understand music theory, like really well. 
um, well, one of them's a, a, a music professor. So of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like they, they talk about these jazz artists or fusion artists or like people I don't even know about. And like, you know, I have nothing to bring to these conversations because they've been like that since they were in high school. Though. Like they were always really steeped in this stuff. And I was just always kind of like the dumb, the dumb end of the hammer in the group, you know, yeah. uh, I was just kind of the dumb rock and roll friend, I guess. Um, but as I've gotten older, man, I do, I get way more interested in that stuff and way more, uh, wanting to experience especially especially visual art man rob pryor is somebody that that's turned you know he hasn't turned me on to it it's just being around him more lately and like watching him paint or watching his some of his apprentices apprentices paint it's like holy crap man like i love this so much and like i've, I've started to kind of uh you know seek out um visual art a lot more sculptures and that kind of thing yeah i love it and 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 museums man. like that's you know Museums are my favorite things on days off. Like if I can find a uh, any kind of museum. Yeah, I mean, historical aviation. I mean, even aquariums now. Where I I need to like learn something from like a visual like with like a visual aid from it. Like I just yeah. I don't know. I just there's a uh, I don't know if you've ever watched Doctor Who, I, I, yeah. and I don't know what season it was. Bill Nighy, uh, the British actor, was in it. But they're in a museum, and I obviously whatever the museum is, it's real because it's got the Van Gogh. Uh, the Starry Night, a bunch of his stuff work, yeah. and they're talking about this. And Van Gogh appeared, whatever, because if you watch the show, it's people yeah. come and go. And the, the actor who plays Van Gogh, famous actor, he's walking through the museum, and he hears this curator, Bill Nye, he described two people on the tour what Starry Night, what Van Gogh meant to art, and how he was looked down upon in his time, but how magnificent his work is. And the scene cuts, and like I never watch the show, but every time this thing pops up, I get emotional because like Van Gogh walks by, stops, and he starts crying because he realizes that his legacy has surpassed what people were telling him at the time, and yeah. how happy these people were just staring at the Starry Night or that famous field picture. Um, and it was just like second, it was very cool to me because it's like you imagine if those guys came back that wrote songs in the seventies or painted in the 80s, whatever they were, and they, they could see like people, how that song is still being played on the radio or people adding to their playlist still, how yeah. happy they would be. Yeah, man. It's a, uh, legacy is a, is a, it's an interesting thing. Like I, I'm in this, I, I think this probably comes more from me not having children than anything, but like, I think about um, like, what am I going to leave to the world? Or what, what, what is my purpose in being here? And, um, I, you know, I've also been looking at myself super psychologically over the past couple of years and, uh, I'm realizing that like one of my fears, and I don't know where this comes from and maybe it's something everybody experiences. I'm again, I'm not trying to say I'm a fucking unicorn with this or anything, but I have this giant fear of like passing away and like no one knowing I ever existed. And it's going to happen, by the way, like eventually through generations, no one's going to know ever again that like, like, that's just how the world is. I don't, you know, we can have these super important people and we, we've had some of them pass away recently where it's like, oh my God, yeah. you know, uh, who is the, who's the, who's the latest person that passed away that, that was sort of Bob Newhart, uh, Bob, yeah, well, right. Bob Newhart in the, in the, in the eighties, man, was like a, was a comedy icon, like yeah. icon, like yeah, household name and he passes away and it's a blip on the radar for for half a day and then you know he's just sort of dusted off into the into the universe you know uh alongside matthew perry and and you know whoever else has whoever. passed away yeah and i say matt because matthew perry pops in my mind when we're talking about this but um you know but why do I, why do I care so much? And that, that's a beautiful scene with Van Gogh. I can imagine like him not thinking that he ever amounted to anything. And then all of a sudden you get this scene of him realizing yeah, that he did. I, I got to find that. Uh, it's such a profound, like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a show and stuff, but it's like, it's such a, it always makes you wonder if people like, would you, uh, like Michael Jordan's, uh, the last scene of the documentary series, would they show these athletes or whoever watching their old baseball clips or you yeah. hear like Willie Mays or, uh, Hank Aaron, you see these people talk about their careers and when they saw clips or whatever, and you're kind of like, it's like it's it's just so fascinating because you're still talking about these people. 
Yeah. After it's just it's such a weird. I don't even know how to describe it. But that Van Gogh thing, fuck, so fucking profound. Well, it it would you know that again, man. You know, it, it's like I, you know, I, I I honestly I honestly think that that like the real legacy and what we're really here as humans to do is to, is to is to pass on what we know and what we've learned to our children and to raise good kids and to leave leave not to to leave the world great for them, but to also raise. A, a, another generation that will continue to will continue that forward right will continue right. to pay that thing forward and and i guess i'm 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 out of that loop right i'm not i don't have any children and i never will have children so uh you know my music and my whatever i'm trying to leave for the world is is all i've got and it's the only way for me to ever be remembered like the, the only memory that the world will ever have of me is whatever i create and i hope that i'm that i can create something worthy of being remembered for you know and and right. and, and and not remembered like oh eric this eric this. i'm i'm saying like that that even if it's just the thing that gets remembered like even if it's just the song like nobody remembers who wrote it you know but like that thing carries on and endures and and people can can it can continue to help people and heal people or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. It's, it, it's interesting you say that about Van Gogh because it was like, and again, <laughs> I have no fucking Van Gogh, but it, it is like that, that actually like, I, I know why that's so emotional. Cause I think that all of us in some sort of way, you know, we, uh, you know, I forget who said this, it, it, this isn't my original thought, but it's that, you're not you're not scared of dying you're scared of you're scared of missing out right yeah you know like fomo you're, 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 of like you're scared the, the, yeah. the world's going to keep turning without you yeah and, and i don't is, know if it's is, like is that more scary than dying you know um and and because so i think there is this in i'm not saying in everybody but i i think that in a lot of people there is this urge to want to be remembered for who you were and why you're here and um all of that, interestingly enough, is is you know I've often said that that I think I want to be cremated because I don't know if there's a point in me had, occupying a space in the ground with a stone that you know in one or two generations no one would no one would ever come see me anyway like no one's right. gonna come visit my grave you know uh, that's kind of sad too <laughs> you know I'd rather just I'd rather just uh, you know be spread out somewhere and you know turned into a tree you know. Yeah, the, the, those those tree graveyards are interesting. You see, you know, you know that is where they they put you the bulb, right? Yeah, they they put you in a they plant you as the fertilizer for the tree, and they plant the tree, and then you fertilize the tree, and the tree is your gravestone. I I love that idea, man. That makes me super I, super I just, happy. Actually. I just came up, thought of this idea. What if you like you did that, but like it was like like a you buried like a piece of say you buried Hitler. They back then the trees grew, it but like it's like the tree became like eat like evil or like it had like this weird essence. Like it just like the leaves were just like, don't, dude, don't give away story ideas on here, man. You should write that. Well, I said it here first. So if this is dated <laughs> after, that's a good story idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, like, the evil tree. Yeah. The giving tree. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's super, I don't know. It's just fascinating to me. I, I recently bumped into my, uh, or I was talking to on social media, my old music teacher. And I wasn't, I didn't, I took drums in middle school just to, for whatever. Um, but as I got older in high school, I had to take this one music class. So a bunch of my nerdy musician friends took music theory, which is uh, Fuchs and like all this compositional stuff with like piano. And mm -hmm. and I just did because my friends are there. And like, you know what, senior year, like I don't give a fuck. And it was the most tough. I didn't understand any of it. I didn't get, I still don't understand music in the sense of like piano songs. And every time I was, yeah, but, just you, like, but you sing, but you sing like a bird. So what yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and like he goes, John, he goes, I knew you were full of shit the whole time. That whole that whole class. I, I goes, I knew you were there because your friends. You you still passed with honors and all this stuff. He goes, the reason why I liked you in that class is because you brought joy and you you had this kinetic energy, making everyone else better because you were that mm. you were the one guy in that class and I had. Not to be stereotypical, uh, but my Asian friend, um, I think his name was, J it was a silent J. Um, it's been twenty something years. Master piano player, like does stuff for the sy symphonies all around the world. Master. Okay. My other friends, guitar, just all this crazy shit, and piano players and whatever, stand up bass, all this shit. 
And I was just sitting there just goofing off, not goofing off, but like kind of like, yeah, who gives a fuck, right? This is right. three months of my life. The, the tea, he literally said, John, you brought joy to me because you still showed up. You didn't know what you're doing. And every time you had to do like, oh, John, you wrote, he would always be like, you'd have to write like a piano song, like 12 bars, play a melody. And then he'd always get me and everyone in the class knew I was full of shit. And he'd be like, John, that's a really good piece. Can you play it again? It was different every time. <laughs> and for the longest time, I'm like, I'm like, God, this guy's fucking stupid. <laughs> and uh, and lo and behold, he goes, John, I knew you were full of shit time, but he goes, you were happy in those moments doing that, living yeah. on the edge, and you made everyone else better in that class. So I was like, you know what? That was actually really cool to hear that after 20 years because I thought I got one over dude, on you. That's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, you're like, you know, look, you know, John – for people who don't know, John's a super intelligent person. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't surprise me one bit that, that, but that you would be good at that. Even if you didn't get one over on him, that you could like, you know, work your way through it without. Yeah. I mean, I remember know. we'd be in that class and the teacher turns back and we'd be hitting each other with music stands and like just d paper airplane session notes. And like, oh shit. It's just like, it was just like a, is this, a, is, it, is this at the military school? No, this was a uh, senior year of high school. Okay. Got so it. this this would have been two thousand three, two thousand four. Okay, so you weren't in military school in high school; you were just regular. No, high school. I no, I okay. could have got away with that in college. I mean, yeah, I've got okay. other stuff there, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I just thought it was super fascinating. Like I would like people, like at least for me, I like I think I'm more successful around a more su not successful. I, I'm better off with people around me that they don't have to do the best of what they do, but they give mm -hmm. a fuck and they show up. And right. I think whether it's with work or touring with crews and bands and doing other stuff I do where it's just like, if you're with someone who's happy to at least be there and be present, yeah, that just makes my job easier. Well, that's just, that's anything, man. You know, you want, you want, yeah, you want, you want the people around you to be, you're talking about crews and stuff, man. It's like, there's nothing worse than, than being on tour with somebody who's, who's just mopey and doesn't, because they don't want to be there because they'd rather be doing something else. And it's like, well, go do something else. Correct. Yeah. I, I don't get that. It's like, especially, and like I just had to talk last week with someone where it's just like vendors, you kind of get thrown out there because you're not like a, but if you're like a, a crew person that tours that band, no matter what it is, there is a, there's a sense of like with the right crew, the sense of protection where it comes to, you know what the band wants and needs, you know, what's conducive to make everyone's job that works for that band easier. And if you are a new person, no one's asking you to fit in right away but at least to be observant enough and care enough to kind of understand what, how everyone clicks and don't bring in that ego or this, I don't want to fucking be here type thing where it's just like, yep. dude, if this is a proper album cycle, you're doing 300 shows with these people for close to three years. And you have to, it's just, it, it weighs a lot on dealing with the negative energy of that. And obviously this isn't saying that if you're dealing with something at home or like, we all have that stuff we deal with and, but you're also around the right group of people that, you could talk to about that on a day off mm. or a show day. It's like, I don't know. It's just to the point now where it's like, I can, I'm lucky. I can pick and choose who I, would I work with? And if I'm in a situation where the crew sucks or a bad person is toxic, or I'm just like, I don't have to be like, my happiness right now is more valuable to me than what I used to perceive as a resume or career thing. And yeah. I think the sooner people realize that the better off they'll be, especially if they're in that type of weird situation where it feels like, they're okay, but they just can't deal with this negative energy always around them. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's, uh, uh, you, you have to, it's why it's, you know, look, I, I see a lot of people online say this is bullshit. I don't think it's bullshit. It's why I, if any, if any young people ever ask me about, you know, any kind of career advice or anything like that, it's just always don't chase money chase what makes you happy and you know a lot of people say don't ever don't ever chase your passion that's bullshit that's bullshit advice i've seen people say that recently but i don't think it is bullshit advice i think that that you know because i think that if you pick even if even if you pick your passion right let's let, let's say your passion is is uh let's just say your passion's music say your passion is playing in a band and you 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 concentrate all your your time and effort on that. Well, let's say your band sucks. Let's say it's terrible, but you're still super driven about that, and you're pursuing that. A, you're happy. Yes, you have to. Yes, you probably have to figure out a different a, a day job, right. but you're still happy. And the thing about picking a direction like that is, you'll spend your maybe you won't spend ten thousand hours there if it's not working out, but you're going to spend a lot of time there. 
and you're going to learn other skills and that's going to open up another other doors are going to open for you in the same realm right Correct. and maybe that other door opens up and you walk through that other door into another part of the music business maybe it's maybe it's a and r work for a label maybe it's studio stuff maybe it's production maybe it's whatever you're still involved in something you really love to do and you've still got that other skill set that you started with back here Correct. which was playing music right you can always go back and do that but you know but but as that next door opens then you you wholeheartedly pursue the next thing let's just say music production you wholeheartedly pr pursue this music production thing and then you become really good at that too and maybe that opens up another door for you somewhere. Maybe that opens into like an A and R job or at a, at a label. Maybe you decide you want to get into the business side of music, and you and you you enter that door. Well, guess what? Now you've got you're still in a in a in a in a, in a career path that you're excited about. You're probably making money, and uh, you know maybe your talent wasn't playing guitar, but now you've really found your talent. And maybe 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 you were pretty good at the production thing, but now you've figured out this my talent is really finding artists. Well guess what? Now you've got this talent for finding artists and working in A and R, but you've also you can work in a studio and you understand production and you can play an instrument. And none of that would have happened if you had gone, where's the where's the hundred thousand dollar a year job? That's all I want. I'm gonna go be a uh I'm gonna go be a um an analyst for a, uh, you know, for a, for a, for a, uh, financial firm, you know, and I'm going to make six figures a year because that's because I want money. And then you're just drowning in unhappiness, Correct. you know, for the, for the rest of your life. Uh, you got to find what you're passionate about, happy about happy doing, because you're going to be doing this for the majority of your life. If, if you choose a career path like that. And so, when I see people that are unhappy doing what they're doing, especially in a crew environment or a music environment, which is what we work in, it really is, man. My 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 uh, my inclination is just to tell them, like, hey, why don't you go do something else? You know, what are you doing here? Right. Like, there's there's, if, is it just our camp? Is it just here, or do you really not like what you're doing? Because if you really don't like what you're doing, there are a thousand and one other things that you could that you could do out there that you would you know you could find your passion you could find the thing that you really are happy about you know sometimes that happens too because people take that journey like i was talking about and they end up you know maybe they did want to be a musician and they end up they're on a crew now and they're a, they're a guitar tech or and by the way none of our techs are unhappy i'm not i'm just using this no, as yeah, yeah right. but 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 you end up as a guitar tech and you're like i want to be the rock star and i should be the rock star and i you know it's like okay man you you did you took the journey you went to the next thing well okay, you're bitter maybe because you're not doing the thing you wanted to do. So use this opportunity to start doing that thing again. You, you might still have to do your fucking gig, but I mean, dude, Zach was a guitar tech for a minute, right? Yeah. Like Zach was back, back in the day. Like he, you know, he was this guitar prodigy and then, you three know, three doors down, saliva. And then, and then, and then yeah. He, but yeah, he had to go, he had to go be a tech for saliva and three doors down. I think Chevelle was another band that he was a tech for for a second before he found his way back in. You know, so as long, but he kept himself in a, in a, uh, he kept himself to allow he, himself to chase he, that, get that goal. He kept himself in the environment he was passionate about, yep. you know? So I don't know how we got off on that, but <laughs> I'm into it. How about that picture he showed us recently of, uh, dude, that he, I'm he hanging on to, to that. Yeah. I'm hanging on to, to that. I've, I've got, I've got a picture of the picture. I need him to post that because that I've is got, the I've most. Got, I've got a picture of the picture. It's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. It went from to hey, don't take a picture to Eric. You said you weren't going to take a picture. <laughs> Zach, Zach showed us a picture of him when he was uh, when he was like fourteen years old, and it, he looks like the prettiest girl I've ever I've ever seen. He looks like uh, Kelly Lynch in Roadhouse that sleeps with Patrick Swayze. It might be. He's at least he was doing what he was passionate about. <laughs> right, right, Patrick Swayze. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I know we, uh, <laughs> you've got the Shine Down Hot Sauces. Yeah, dude. They're doing awesome. And we got the third yeah. one a uh, couple weeks, I guess. I don't yeah, know. third one's coming out in a couple weeks, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to say this, man. Like, the, the, uh, uh, I'm not a hot sauce person. I'm just not, I, I, it's just not that I don't eat hot sauce. I'm just not a, I'm not, a, I'm not into hot sauces. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm getting this berry, berry sent over because this has been berries. The Barry's project, like it's his baby, and I love it. Uh, he sent over uh, the first hot sauce, and I'm expecting like Tabasco or so, you know, like because I'm an idiot. I'm expecting it like to taste like all the other hot sauces. And 
Dude, it is, it's a symptom sauce, I think was the first one. And it is so good, man. It's not overly hot. No, I it's awesome. It, um, I, I, uh, I'll get like a rotisserie chicken or something and like just put some on the side and just use it kind of like a dipping sauce. And, uh, uh, it's got this garlic base to it, man. It's super, super, super tasty. Yeah. Uh, and none of the, none of the sauces are outrageously hot. Like none of them are going to like, are, are going to be painful. No, they have a taste to them as opposed to just the heat. Yeah, they 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 were made to to use for, as flavoring, not heat. You know, not just heat. You get a little bit of heat out of them, and they get progressively hotter as they go. So the third one will be the hottest one, but uh, it's still not. Uh, you know, it's not painfully hot. So yeah, the uh... and, and by the way, man, they're doing great. Like the 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 uh, uh, the response. I think I think I think we crashed the website when we first put them out. So. Well, that's amazing. Those, the owners, the people that behind the company, uh, Torchbearers, they came out to the Bethlehem PA show. Yep. They had the, again, talk about a weird day with everything that went on with whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But like it was when I first saw them, I got them situated, parked up and brought them back. I bet my head, like every time you guys have a guest or a guest backstage, I'm always trying to picture what, knowing what these people do, what they look like or how they yep. act. And they completely caught me off guard. Like to the point where it's like I assumed I always picture like food people being like bad scientists type people, but these people were like the people like I would have hung out with in high school, where it's just like nerds into comic books, into pop culture, into music, yep. super, super awesome, like no ego, yeah, and super rad. And like it was just kind of yeah, cool. They were, like they were very that. nice, man. And yeah. then, and then and Barry got to go, I think, the next day, yeah. right? And he, he he took off and, and went and, and toured the facility. Yeah, and, so him and, and Sanjay went to do some behind the scenes like factory stuff and like Yep. I just I love it, man. And they're yeah. all they all met like through high school, they're friends with each other, and they just kept in touch. And when, every time they expand, they thought of the next friend that they thought could be successful there. And it's such a it had like such a very uh family orientated type of vibe where mm -hmm. it's like they're all there, they all love what they do. And they're all there to like go to the next step. When you look at some of these bond pod companies or corporations, it's like it's just a job, right? Yep. We're Again, there. It's like passionate. a way of life. Correct. They they found something they're passionate about. And and the other thing too is like I, I guess the other side of that coin of what we were talking about earlier is uh unless you are passionate about what you're doing, if you're trying to start a business, it's never gonna be successful. Right. Like I've gotten into a couple of things that that I thought were cool that I uh, saw saw an opportunity to, to be involved in, but I wasn't passionate about them and they never work out ever. Like, they just don't work. There's so much time involved yeah. in, in that kind of thing. You know, that's the other thing, man. Like, you know, it, it's, it's uh, if you do pursue your passion, it's exhausting and it's, it's not a lot of instant gratification either. Fuck it's no. a, but, but, if you're doing what you love, there doesn't it doesn't have to be that. It's never tiring. I mean, there's times right. I wake up where I'm just kind of like, "Fuck, I don't want to record two episodes of Spear Talk," not because I don't want yeah. to, but because it's like I know every episode I record, you're talking ten to twenty hours, including the research, the editing, yeah. the artwork, the actual interview, the talking. Where you're just kind of like, I don't think people realize the amount of work that goes into it. And so sometimes when people are like. I want to start a podcast before I'd be like, Oh yeah, do it. It's fun. I'm so brutally honest now where I'm kind of like, you realize this is another job. And right. if, if you well, want to do it the right way, it's going to be fucking time consuming. You have to do this on days where you've got other shit going on, whether it's personal work and you have to follow through because once people realize, at least with the spear talk and obviously with this now and everything where it's like the amount of work, they, they realize that we're not doing this because we don't, we're bored. I mean, right. we could easily not do this and be like, but it's it's fun. And yeah. it, I think people see, people respect that because they see the sense of joy we have talking about the most ridiculous shit. I mean, some of it's serious, some of it yeah. imbecilic, um, <laughs> but it's, 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 I think people need to realize that if you, there's a lot of work that goes into this shit. Yeah, man, it, it really is. And, and I, again, like we're sorry we missed the last two weeks, actually. Like, we, we yeah, like, Bob, well, I think you, you but, rip your arm it, off and I'm yeah, so it's well, like, we get it. 
Yeah, I mean, well, it, it, it's kind of hard when we're, you know, we have we have to get an episode done and we're both on airplanes and there's no, you know, there's kind of no way to do it. But like even today, man, I was like, I had to go to the doctor and I had to do all this stuff, and I was yeah. like, man, I, yeah, I don't have the energy for this today. I'm, 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 I'm pretty sore and tired and out of it. But it's like, like you said, it's like, no, nah, man, we got to get this done because you know and in a way it's like it's nice too man because you know you feel like people are counting on you in sort of a weird, weird way um uh but uh but yeah man it, it is it's 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 a i mean i know you put a lot into spear talk i mean that that's that's a it is it's, it's just a it's a whole other career choice you know but it obviously is something you enjoy doing because you're really good at it you're really good at 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 you know all of the uh the minutia that the, the things you have to concentrate on you know you're talking about artwork and t-shirts and mugs and and uh you know yeah then i gotta read all these books reading right i was about to say and documentaries and like yeah. it's, it's a lot yeah you can't fake your way through <laughs> this isn't music class <laughs> you know? right right yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm gonna bring that guy out here and just lie to him you, you yeah. won't you won't you won't research your next two guests uh you won't you won't you won't, you won't not research your next two guests that and then interview tough. him. Well, yeah, I mean, one of them, like the one of the episodes I got coming up, I'm recording again with Donnie Dust and Barry Kirch for part two. Well, um, you know, and that's that you don't have to research that too. Correct, but the other one I got to do, yeah. I, he spent like 32 years undercover CIA going after cartels, and he just put a book out. So I'm kind of like, I, I don't want to. I mean, I probably could, but I'm not gonna. <laughs> um, but like, so the other thing too, uh, my second comic book comes pre-order yes. this, this week. Love it. Uh, so stay tuned for news on that. And then this first edition physical sold out. There's a variant cover for this first issue. It's available now. Uh, it's digital too, which I think that I'm so anti-digital books, comic book stuff. But some people that like to collect stuff or if you're on a plane, the Kindle's easier or whatever. They don't want to damage the book or the comic book. But the other thing I noticed was shipping costs today around the world – the digital allows people to not have to pay an exorbitant amount of money just to ship a piece of paper. Right. And yeah. now they can be in Amsterdam or Germany or Australia and read it. Uh, so it's got its benefits, but again, that option's out there. I just, I don't, it's just, I feel like the rest of this year is going to be super creative. We have a whole other project we're working on that's gearing up. Um, it is. Soon. Um, that people still have no idea what it is. Like, like the what, it, and I'll say this on here. I think that. I love the fact that people think it's my new podcast guests for the rest of the year. Okay. And I, and I love it. That's everything I've got back for that. Everyone's like, dude, I can't wait for these new episodes. Like who are they partially talking true. With? Partially true. Yeah. Partially. Um, could be true. Could be true. But probably but, uh, not the, probably not the whole story. Right. Right. But I, I just love the fact that there's so much like, like potential, like so much bizarreness around this thing where it's just like when people finally realize they're like, Holy fuck. Like this is rad. And so yeah, all man, the I'm... feedback I've gotten from people in the industry that know kind of what the idea is, they're like, dude, this is the most ridiculous yet like cool way to do this in terms of like completely like ground level in terms yeah. without dealing with all these fucking people telling you what you can and can't do. And yeah, yeah. so yeah, I mean, I I, th I think that uh, that you hit the nail on the head right there, man. Like, the more creative things you can do without anybody telling you what to do, the better off you're going to yeah. be. You know. Yeah. That's something that 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 you know, Shine Down has gotten some escape velocity from that a little bit. We were able to kind of, but uh, there's nothing like just creating for yourself and then being able to show it to people. You know? Yeah. And having people at a mass level actually resonate with it, be like, you know what, this is kind of cool. Yep. What, uh, any other updates on your personal stuff, your, uh, um, your story type thing? Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm actually working on some business. I have a lot of business stuff to work through with that stuff, man. Like, uh, so I, I, but it is, it is in the, like it's, it's happening. It will, it will be out. I don't know to what, uh, to what degree, I don't know to, to what, how grandiose the release will be. It honestly depends a lot on shine down stuff. Uh, you know, that's just what it is, um, as to whether or not it will get a big release or just a kind of a not big release. Yeah. So, so uh, we'll see, but, uh, but it will, it will be coming out and, uh, I've got a bunch of other stuff I want to do, man. I got a bunch of other music I want to make and stories I want to write and things I want to do. So um, I got to get that, get that out of my life and, and moved on from it. So yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, next week we got to talk about Bigfoot. Yeah. For sure. I've been, I've been in a Bigfoot 
rabbit hole like i mean beyond <laughs> beyond like my my youtube algorithm is nothing but bigfoot now well let me uh yeah i think we do because we always try to so skirt like, around the mount st helen stuff but i want i, I let me so do dude, a deep dive I, this week i found a whole thing talking about that Oh, do you find that? Uh, no, I didn't find it. I didn't find that interview, which is I weird, found, right? But I found I, I found a documentary that that talks about it. All right. So, yeah. like, but dude, there's uh, there's there's a whole Bigfoot thing that I didn't know existed, and like, I'm I'm in now, and it makes me want to go, not Bigfoot hunting. That's not it. It makes me want to go experience something like that, like more than ever, for sure and uh yeah so next week we, we do we maybe next week we can just we can like we you know we can we can talk about bigfoot yeah i've been to it <laughs> awesome later buddy peace peace you will rip your other arm off tonight <laughs>